The Pacific Northwest is subject to one of the most intense wave climates in the world, and these extreme waves play a large role in flooding events along the coast. In light of this, we are investigating the impact of projected changes in wave climate on extreme total water levels. The Pacific Northwest faces a variety of uh, coastal problems. We have uh, bluff and dune erosion, flooding and inundation events, along with structural failure in areas that uh, structures are allowed. And this really only becomes a coastal hazard when we have infrastructure and communities and houses built along our coast. So in order to better understand these flooding events, we need to pull apart all of the different uh, pieces that make up a high water level. And we'll define this as a total water level. And it's really just, uh, again, imagine stacking all of these pieces of the water level on top of each other. Uh, we can add the mean sea level, which is just the average sea level with respect to some datum, uh, to the astronomical tide, which is just our deterministic tide, which we know fairly well. On top of that, we can add our non-tidal residual, which is any elevation change in the water level that's not due to the tide. So this could be uh, due to El Nino effects, it could be due to storm surges, or just seasonal temperature changes in the water. And then finally, we can add the wave runup, which is the wave-induced component of the total water level, and that's the uh, area of this I will be focusing most on today. And that's a function of the beach slope and the deep water wave height and the deep water wave length. And again, you can just stack all of these on top of each other and get um, a vertical estimate of what our water levels are. So here, if we move away from that schematic and look what a time series actually looks like uh, from recorded measurement data in, off the coast of Oregon, we have our tide time series and our non-tidal residuals, and those are taken, uh, they're measured at, from tide gauges. And then we have our run-up, where that, again, is a function of wave height and wave length, which is a function of wave period, and those can be measured uh, using a wave buoy. And then if we add those together, we can get a total water level time series for off the coast of Oregon. And so in our work, since we're looking at flooding events, we really want to focus on the extremes. However, if we're going to do projections of what is a 100-year event or the uh, storm that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year, we, we have to notice that our time series is really only 30 years long, so we're perhaps limited by how short these records are. It, it's, and especially when we're looking at combining all of these events, we're really only getting one roll of mother, Mother's Nature's dice. Uh, who's to say that we've already seen the largest tides occurring with the biggest wave events and the biggest storm surge events? So my master's research has uh, primarily been involved with creating a statistical model that will create full simulations and sy synthetic time series of each of these individual components that we can then uh, get long 500-year time series and uh, many random realizations of these extreme events. So in order to do that, we first have to uh, model our extreme events. And as you can see from the graph, the figure on your left, uh, the whole distribution, the whole total water level distribution, behaves very differently than the tail end of the distribution, which I've blown up right here to your right. It has maybe an exponential fit instead. So we choose, there, there are different ways to model extremes, and we choose to use a peak over threshold model where if you imagine all of these black dots are our, our, our total water level events over time, we pick all the events over some threshold, uh, this red line right here, and we can fit a non-stationary or a time-dependent extreme value model to that. And here we add in seasonality to this model because we know that extreme events are more likely to occur during winter when we have big storms. And you can see here is a projection of the 100-year event and how it changes over time. So again, this is a great estimate of uh, the 100-year event, but we're really only using it based on a 30-year record. So instead, we will simulate all of these individual components to get uh, more random realizations of this. This first plot up here is the wave height, and then we have the wave period, the non-tidal residual. They're all the same colors as before. 
the astronomical tide, and down here, the total water level. And we start these simulations at one day in time, and we simulate a wave height. And based on the joint dependencies between uh, that and the non-tidal residual, it will seed the non-tidal residual. The wave period also has a conditional dependency with the wave height, so the wave height will seed that as well. And then the astronomical tide we can uh, pick out from any day and time because it's deterministic. And then finally, when we add all these components together, we get a total water level time series, a synthetic time series of varying lengths. We can make it as long as we want. And here, this is just showing you uh, two years, but we made these five or 500 years long and simulated about uh, 50 simulations for the time period. So I'll be showing you a few of these return level plots. Here we just have the re event return level and then the return period on the x-axis. And uh, all these black dots are the model or the observational data. The red is the model fit that where we're extrapolating the 100-year event. And the green are confidence intervals. And we can add our simulated results onto this. And you can see that our total water levels, which are indicated by this, uh, the mean of these simulations, this yellow dot, are just slightly elevated but have um, smaller confidence bounds. So that perhaps is giving us uh, more robust estimates of what these, uh, how big these events can get by including all these other combinations that our record maybe has not seen. So this is a great way to get an idea of what our 100-year event is right now, but we, uh, we know that what the 100-year event now, it may not be the 100-year event uh, 30 years from now. So in order to do that, uh, or in order to investigate the relative relationship, future wave climate scenarios and how they will impact um, our future flooding events, we have some data that in this study, we have near surface winds generated from four global climate models and two uh, radiative forcing scenarios. And uh, those drive a regional or global and regional scale numerical model, a numerical wave model. And that's been done by Ericsson et al. for the entire Eastern North Pacific. We're just going to focus on one area off the coast of Oregon and just today on one uh, model, one GCM. So we can take these time series and run them through our simulators. We can get return level estimates for uh, RCP 4.5 mid 21st century, RCP 8.5 mid 21st century, and RCP 8.5 late 21st century. And it may be surprising to you that we actually have larger waves with a um, the medium radiative forcing scenario, lower radiative forcing scenario, but that is actually consistent with Erickson et al's findings for the entire eastern North Pacific that uh, with the higher scenarios, radiative forcing scenarios, there maybe is a uh, shift, a uh, latitudinal transition zone. So anything below 50 degrees latitude, we actually see a decrease in wave heights. And this could be due to um, a shift in winds towards the poles. So we'll quickly apply this to the Oregon coast. There, uh, we'll focus on a 25 kilometer section called the Rockaway Littoral Cell in Northern Oregon. Just if we look at this plot right here, just notice these, this very, very red area is erosion, the blue is accretion or a gain of sand. And this is the most populated area in the cell and it's been heavily eroding. So once we have our water levels, we need to compare, compare them to something. And on the coast, our first line of defense is really these uh, dune formations, the highest elevation before our houses. So if we compare our water level uh, to our topography data, any time the water level is in between the dune toe, which is the base of the dune, and the dune crest, we can, uh, that can be indicative of erosion, because that means the water level is actively hitting the dune. Today we'll focus on over, the overtopping regime, where it's any time the water level is above the dune height. That can be indicative of flooding. Obviously, in order to do this, we need geomorphological inputs. So we have, uh, this is the North Arrow. Here's a Rockaway littoral cell. We have great longshore variable data of beach slope, dune toe, and dune height uh, from LIDAR data. And you can just imagine this schematic as a cross section uh, with 100 meter resolution here. And now we can apply that overwash regime and look at what areas have total water levels that overtop these 
Dune Heights right here. So if we go back to our wave estimates, we can look at the 100-year event from the mid-century RCP. And you can see that about 40% of the coastline is possibly flooded by these large waves. If we then add on the uh, mid and late century RCP 8.5, you can see that it, it's about 10% lower, and that's because these wave heights just weren't as big. So again, this is really just uh, very preliminary results. We are only focusing on how these projected wave climates have changed, but obviously there could be changes in sea level rise and also uh, changes in non-tidal residuals and, and things like that, and we haven't really uh, added that into this model yet. That is our ongoing research. And then finally, we also only have taken one global climate model, and in order to really understand this, uh, the magnitude of the differences between here, it would be good to use a variety of global climate models and maybe some more ensemble runs to get better estimates of that range. So here are my conclusions, and um, you can just read those. 